G'day, you are listening to the Sirens of Audio, the Doctor Who podcast you have to hear to believe. I'm your host, my name is Dwayne, and tonight we're going to be looking at Big Finish Audio Main Range number 261. It's the most recent release on the Big Finish Main Range. It's called The Psychic Circus. It is a prequel, or is it a sequel, to the 1980. Eight story from the classic series the greatest show in the galaxy it, that was written by Stephen Wyatt the psychic circus was also written by Stephen Wyatt so we are going to have a closer look at that and not only that we are going to have a chat with the writer himself Stephen Wyatt so very much looking forward to sharing that little chat with you that Stephen and I had recently but first I'd like to share a bit of news that I discovered on the Doctor Who news page and that is on a website called Humble Bundle. They're a, a charity website that puts together packages of pay what you want uh, that go to charity. So great content, pay what you want for it. And this one is a Doctor Who comic and audio bundle. So if you head over to uh, Humble, Humble Comics and Audio Books, um, you can, there's three tiers of bundles that you can, that you can purchase. I'm not going to go through the comics, but I'm going to go through the audio books that you can get from Big Finish. On tier one, pay $1 or more. So you get to choose how much you want to contribute to the charity. Um, for $1 or more, you will get Unit, The Coup, Dalek Empire, The Fearless, parts one to four. That's Dalek Empire four, basically. Um, you're going to get the I Davros series. Or is it I Davros, the Davros Mission? I think it's just the Davros Mission, which is an interesting one to get. And Doctor Who Destination Nerva, the very first Tom Baker Big Finish Audio. That's Tier 1. Tier 2, get a bunch of comics as well. On top of the Tier 1, this is you get what you get in Tier 1, plus these for Tier 2. So pay $8 or more to get the comics, plus Unit, Time Heals, Unit the Longest Night, Unit the Wasting... Those three unit stories are from the... They're not the new unit stories. Um, they are the unit series that Big Finish did many years ago. David Tennant features in one of them. I think he's in the... I think he might be in a couple of them, actually. I know he's in at least one of those. So if you like your David Tennant, make sure you have a listen to the, the unit stories. Tier 3 on the Humble Bundle... If you pay $15 or more, you'll get Tier 1 and Tier 2, plus a bunch more comics and these audiobooks. You're going to get uh, Doctor Who Technophobia, Time Reaver, and Death and the Queen. That's a 10th Doctor and Donna collection. You're also going to get Doctor Who Love and War, the Paul Cornell novel that was made into audio by Big Finish. And you're going to get Doctor Who The Lost Stories, The Fourth Doctor. And I, I think there was two... But the one that I can remember off the top of my head is the foe from the future. You're also going to get Unit Extinction, which is one of the new Unit Adventures box sets. So if you head over to DoctorWhoNews.net, you can check out that little news item. And there's a link there that will take you to the Humble Bundles. And you can uh, select your tier. I think it's a great way to raise money for charity. In other audio news, uh, it should be noted that Big Finish has just released Blake 7 Restoration Part 3, the uh, final part of this series of Blake 7 audios. And uh, it's got Paul Darrow on the cover, but of course with the passing of Paul Darrow a little while ago, I, I can't remember if he features in this to some degree or whether um, that was Restoration Part 2. I can't, I can't recall off the top of my head. But Restoration Part 3 is out now, and you can grab that from the Big Finish website. Here's a trailer. From Big Finish Productions. Blake 7. Restoration. Part 3. He's taking it hard, Tarrant. Aren't we all? Villa and Callie knew him the longest. I know, but that doesn't really matter much, does it? With Avon gone... Everything changes? You know it does. Slowly, silently, without anyone knowing, the Quonar parasite took over all the ship's systems. By the time he realized something was wrong, by the time Avon realized something was wrong, it was too late. You could at least try to keep your head down. How many do you see? I don't know. My eyes are stinging from the dust. Two over the ridge there. 
two more. At least four, but there are probably more. Cowards, skulking in the shadows. There I was, lost and alone, on the verge of dying, and in walks Zira Voss. You weren't going to die. So you say. You've trapped me here, haven't you? Trying to finish me off once and for all. Alter One? Can you hear me? Alter One? Can you understand me? The Quonar are the enemy. Mr. President, I might have known. Oh, really? Oh, I hate to be so predictable, Tarrant. But here I am, and here, it must be noted, are you. Welcome to the Imperium Project. Avon never trusted me. I tricked him on Hyperion and lied to you and the others. And now we've lost everything. The President has finally won. Big Finish. We love stories. Okay, so our featured Big Finish story this week is Main Range number 261, the latest release in Big Finish's Doctor Who range. It is called The Psychic Circus. It's a prequel to the greatest show in the galaxy, but it could also be a sequel. No, it, it tells the origins of The Psychic Circus, and he's on the cover. It also has James Dreyfus as the master. We've seen James Dreyfus as the master before in some of the first Doctor Adventures stories, and we have him here again. So uh, why don't we start by listening to the trailer for The Psychic Circus. I see him now. The man who threatens our future. I see him walking across the wastes of Seganax. Do you know his name? He likes to be known as the Doctor. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, Doctor Who, The Psychic Circus. Welcome to The Psychic Circus. The what? Hi there, everybody. I'm the Kingpin, and the gal here on the guitar is Juniper Berry. Peace, love, smiling. Mm, these are dangerous people. You're building a team of the most talented acts in the galaxy. Not scared, are you? No, never. Stick around, guys. I've seen the future. I will do anything to become the greatest clown in the galaxy. Have I ever met you before? Have I? I? I've no idea. Don't ever dream of leaving Segonax. I was wondering when you'd put in an appearance. I thought you liked surprises. You can't hide anymore. Time's running out. Any more fares, please? Any more fares? Big Finish. We love stories. Forgive me, I'm... I'm only a clown. <laughs> so, credits for the Psychic Circus. We've got Sylvester McCoy as the Doctor, James Dreyfus as the Master, uh, Shona Jones, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. She plays Morgana and Minister, Chris Jury as Kingpin, Anna Leong Brophy as Juniper Berry, and Ragnarok God 2, Ian Reddington as the Chief Clown, and Andrew James Spooner as Panpipe. Widiny and Ragnarok God. The audio was directed by Samuel Clemens, cover art by Simon Holub, music and sound design by Steve Foxen. And of course, it was written by Stephen Wyatt. So with that in mind, we would expect it to be quite a similar feel to The Greatest Show in the Galaxy. And having been through that period myself and watching The Greatest Show when it first came out, that uh, I was never been a huge fan of the Daleks. So that was the the greatest show was the other massive story for me for season twenty five, and yes, the Chief Clown was voted as best villain of that particular year. Not that there were too many stories. I mean, he was up against who was he up against? The Cyber Leader, Davros, and the Candyman. So not a great deal of competition there for the Chief Clown, but he was <laughs> he was fantastic. In the role, played by Ian Reddington. So my initial thoughts when I heard this was that it grabbed me. I really enjoyed it. The sound design by Steve Foxen was very similar to The Greatest Show. So 
there are, it, it wasn't copying the sounds of Greater Show in the Galaxy, but a lot of the same elements were there. And it took me right back so that it really felt like I was in that same world that Stephen built all the way back in 1988. It's interesting in that it's one of those stories where the narrative runs for most of the story without the Doctor in it. So there's a, a, a narrative going with the Doctor in virtually a separate story while the formation of the psychic circus is going on virtually for the first three episodes. And so with the Doctor being out of the main action for most of that time, it was interesting to see how Stephen White would bring those two elements together. And sometimes they would crisscross over. Another thing that stood out to me was that there was a bit of chronology that didn't sit with me in my mind, remembering the greatest show in the galaxy. For instance, if we all know the Whiz Kid, we remember the Whiz Kid and how he was an allegory for Doctor Who fans. He comes to the greatest show in the galaxy and with a poster and talks about how they had a tour of the Boreatic Wastes. Well, the psychic circus here doesn't seem to indicate that there was much touring going on. They sort of became the circus and then didn't even become the psychic circus until they came to the planet Seganax. It felt to me like the master was kind of injected into the story as opposed to an essential part of the plot. However, it is a really interesting performance and there are some interesting revelations there. I really loved the fact that Paradise Towers came into the story as well. But I had to listen a couple of times to the end to because I felt that I missed what was going on. There's, I, I was never really all over the concept of the Dark Circus and the Gods of Ragnarok anyway, but I was enthralled by the story and the style of the story. But it was one of those ones, even Greater, greater Show, that I never completely understood. And the, and the same was true here of the Psychic Circus. I had to concentrate really hard, go back and listen to it again, uh, maybe rewind a bit if I, if, if I thought I missed something. Um, to to get fully in my mind what was what was going on. There was also some characters that were missing that stood out to me. Um, first and foremost was the ringmaster. No sign of the ringmaster, so obviously he came into the psychic circus after this story. Um, there's a reference to, to Bellboy, and I think there may be a reference to Flower Child as well, but those characters are not they don't have parts in this story at all. So the, the, the characters from The Greatest Show in the Galaxy are Kingpin, the Chief Clown, Morgana, and Juniper Berry, who's mentioned in Greatest Show in the Galaxy, but she doesn't have a part. And we find out why she doesn't have a part when we listen to Psychic Circus. As far as the featured actors go, Chris Jury as Kingpin is back, um, who was playing a part called Deadbeat in most of The Greatest Show. So he's back as Deadbeat and we find out his motivations and his girlfriend. We know, find out a lot more about her, Juniper Berry. Doing a bit of research into Chris Jury, I found that he was a front runner to play the Seventh Doctor. Did you know that? That that was news to me. I may have heard it before, but I'd forgotten since. But at the time, Chris Jury would have been about 31 years old. So another quite young actor considered for the role of the Doctor at the time. Anna Leong Brophy, she plays Juniper Berry, and she had a part to play in Last Tango in Halifax. I love Last Tango in Halifax. Do you like that too? Fantastic story, and I think it was on Netflix, but it's not there anymore. So I've been recommending it to people, and uh, it's not there anymore. So Derek Jacobi and Nicola Walker, brilliant, brilliant show. Uh, if you get a chance to, to see that, if you haven't seen it already... Make sure you have a look at Last Tango in Halifax. Ian Reddington as the Chief Clown. He had some quite big roles in EastEnders and Coronation Street, the big soapies. But he, he came back to Big Finish a long time ago uh, in a story called A Death in the Family, which was a Seventh Doctor story with uh, the companions Ace and Hex, and, but Evelyn as well. So A Death in the Family was set on a planet where Evelyn had stayed to marry somebody after she left the Sixth Doctor and the Seventh Doctor was going back to visit her. 
And Ian Reddington was in that play playing a character called Nobody No One. And I don't remember too much about it. I'd have to go back and have a listen to that story again. But anything with Maggie Stables as Evelyn Smythe is a must listen. And the the story arc between her and Hex and and who he is is uh, is a good one too. So a death in the family, the Ian Reddington connection, is a good one to go back and have a listen to. And speaking of Ian Reddington, his performance in the audio as the chief clown was chilling i must say it was actually quite scary because he played the psychotic clown in a really chilling way uh for audio um he was he was more menacing uh, when you saw him on television but on the audio he seems more unpredictable which in some ways makes him seem even more dangerous than he did when he was on screen so kudos to ian reddington for for bringing a part that didn't have a great deal to say in the TV episodes to life on audio. A great job, both by Stephen White and Ian Reddington. So, yeah, really, really enjoyed the characterization of the Chief Clown in this one. So, interesting addition of the Master to this prequel story. Not 100% sure that the Master was necessary to be in the story kind of well he was weaved into the story quite well but it felt to me like it could have happened without the master being in it but it was played really well by James Dreyfus, who I always remember from Thin Blue Line with Rowan Atkinson but he plays a really good master I really like, enjoyed him in the first Doctor Adventures he plays a pre-Delgado master I think he's the only pre-Delgado master out there in, in audio land. And he does a good job. I'm not sure if he'll be back. I've seen a bit of social media outrage at some of the comments he's made recently about this or that. But um, I don't really pay too much attention to that. I'm, I'm more interested in the performance rather than what he's talking about on social media. And I think his performance was quite good. So with that said... I was able to chat with Stephen Wyatt recently about the Psychic Circus and uh, some of his recollections from working on the TV show and working on this audio. And uh, I'm happy to be able to share that chat with you right now. Thanks for chatting with me, Stephen Wyatt. Okay, my pleasure. Can you give me a bit of a history of, of yourself as, as a writer? And I also would like to know, based on the subject matter of the Psychic Circus, were you a hippie? Answer to the first that question first. No, um, I I <laughs> I think as the, the sort of comes out in the project, I'm a little bit sceptical about all that. Um, uh, I think Captain Cook says at one point, if you in the uh, original Greatest Show, if you see people talking about peace and love, run a mile. Um, I wouldn't go that far. Um, I've been a writer now for a very long time, uh, a freelance writer. I work, I work in television, obviously, a lot of radio and theatre, which is my greatest love. Um, and uh, The Psychic Circus is my first writing for Doctor Who for over 30 years. So that's quite exciting. How did you get to become a, a writer for Doctor Who in the first place? Well, I was working at that point in the script unit in the BBC, which was a rather wonderful institution which read and commented on scripts submitted by members of the public. Uh, and I sent a copy of the play, a play I had written called Claws, which was a, a comedy about a power struggle in a cat club. And I sent this to John Nathan Turner and John liked it. And he put me in touch with Andrew Cartmel. And I it was a very lucky timing. Andrew had just started as script editor of Doctor Who. So he was new to the job. I was new to the job. And we got on really well and had a very good time. Um, yeah. It just went from there. It just went, and it went very fast uh, because Andrew had inherited a script from Pip and Jane Baker, but otherwise he had to put together a whole, a whole new series in 
very short time. Um, I mean, so short that I never, ever wrote a synopsis of Paradise Towers. The first episode I submitted, and at the end of the first episode, it says, all hail the great architect. What shall we do with him now, chief? And the chief uh, caretaker says, kill him. I had no idea what was going to happen next. Were you aware at the time that your script was basically the first script for this new doctor? Correct. Correct. So, so we were working it all out. And we made the decision, which I was very happy to do, that we, for the moment, we junked all the Doctor Who mythology. No Time Laws, no Gallifrey, no nothing. And that was partly because I think I certainly felt that the previous stuff, Trials of a Time Lord, had got so bound up in uh, Doctor Who mythology that you sort of needed a PhD in Who studies to understand it. And uh, my memory of Doctor okay. Who, I'm old enough to have seen the first episode when it went out, uh, is of fantastic stories about a guy in a police phone box who went to places and had adventures. And at that point, there was no mythology. There, were no, there, was, there was no master, there was no time lords, there was nothing. And that's what I've really always rather liked. Uh, that sort of freedom. Anyway, so Paradise Towers was commissioned and I actually had to take time off from the script unit to write the next three scripts. And I'm not exaggerating. I wrote the first, the episodes two, three and four, I wrote the first draft in a week for all of them. Wow. <laughs> Which is absolutely crazy. Um, but very exciting. So I really was. And in some ways, Paradise Towers is a comedy. So is that is that what you were used to writing at the time? You... I wrote quite a lot of comedy, yes. Um, my The play I, they'd seen was a comedy. And I really rather like quite black humour. So, yes, that was very much the way I came into it. But also the other thing was I wanted to get connected in some way with what was going on in the world around so the starting point was I'd been to visit a friend who had lived in a tower block in the east end of London, which had these nightmare lifts. It was really scary. And that was the starting point. And then Andrew and I talked. He asked me what science fiction writers I uh, liked. And I said, I'm not a great science fiction uh, fan, but I love J.G. Ballard. So we talked about High Rise, which is set in a tower block. That's the only real similarity between the two. But I can remember Andrew saying to me, it's OK, I, I actually have no objection to having a Doctor Who set, a Doctor Who story set in a planet which is a tower block. And we just went from there. Um, but as I say, very fast. Greatest Show in the Galaxy had much, much longer time to prepare and contemplate and that was both good and bad the bad was that we kept on going through you know different ways of doing it it was originally all about computer games and oh before that john nathan turner wanted to do a story built around the doctor who exhibition that was one at somewhere like bewley or somewhere like that one of the stately homes uh, so we had that, then it was a computer thing, then it became a circus, and then at the very last minute it had been planned as a three-part story, and Andrew said, uh, it's going to be a four-part story now, with not all in the studio, but on location. But it went through a, a lot of different variations, and there are lots of drafts of Greatest Show in the Galaxy. Not, not only is, is Greatest Show a great story, uh, it seems very allegorical to the show itself. Was that something that you and Andrew discussed or something you came up with on your own? Um, it was odd. It was never really um, part of the intention. It was much more about the hippie dream and people selling out to the forces of commercialism. I mean, I'm making that very simple, but that was an underlying idea. 
the only part of it which was consciously Doctor Who was in the original version there had been all these characters coming to play computer games and most of them you know could move over Nord, Mags the Werewolf etc and we had this character called the Whiz Kid and he was called the Whiz Kid because he was a computer whiz and then he was suddenly left there and I just thought at the last moment, let's have a bit of fun. Let's make him into a Doctor Who fan. Uh, that was entirely me. I can't blame anybody else. Uh, and so that was the only conscious time that we referred to Doctor Who um, in terms, that was the only conscious, in my head, that was the only time that I uh, actually uh, consciously referenced the show. Okay, so it's been since then that all us diehard fans have read much more into it than there was. <laughs> well, I don't. <laughs> I mean, there may have been. I'll agree. I don't. Um, as I say, mine was much more about a group of idealists who sell out. Did the stories appear on the screen as you envisaged? Were you, were you happy with how they looked? It depends which one you're talking about. I mean, the greatest show in the galaxy. I was absolutely delighted. I mean. Alan Waring did a fantastic job. The casting was well nigh perfect. I mean, everybody was great. And the design was good. Paradise Towers was a bit more of a mixed bag. Um, it was done at speed. Nobody had ever done anything this sort of Doctor Who before. We had a very good director, but, uh, you know, he, he, he was having to get his head around something at speed with somebody who'd hardly ever played the Doctor. The part hadn't been written for Sylvester. Uh, it was just written for a Doctor. And uh, so I've, some elements work very well, some performances work very well, some of it not quite so well. Um, so yes, I, I mean, I don't, I not, wouldn't complain about it. I think they did a very good job on the, but, Greatest Show was sort of well nigh perfect in terms of how it was handled. And the look of it um, was kind of forced because of the production problems at the time, wasn't it? We had a wonderful time on location. We got some great footage. Um, <clears throat> and then we came back and the studio had us best stops in it. So the studio where it was going to be shot, it, the, all the interior scenes, was unusable. And the BBC was all for just cancelling the whole thing and claiming on the insurance. And John, to his credit, and the designer, David Lasky, worked out that it would be possible to do it if we, they erected a tent on the car park in Elstree Studio, which is what happened. Um, from a technical point of view, this was something of a nightmare because of the sound. Can't you get planes going? Up? I think in terms of the show, it was pure gain because it actually felt like a real tent in a real place. Whereas if you try to think it back to it being in a studio, it would have felt much more studio bound and fake. So all those corridors they go on. Um, so, Ultimately, I think it was to the benefit of the show, but it was a nightmare, technically, for, for the people involved. And the show in Van Nillian didn't happen. So let's fast forward 30 years. You've, you've just released on Big Finish The Psychic Circus, which is a sequel and a prequel to Greatest Show in the Galaxy. But it's not the first time Big Finish has released characters created by you on audio. We had the, the MAG series last year. Did you have any input into that? No, I didn't. Um, I just gave my permission for the character to be used. Um, but Jessica is a, is a great mate. And we've got to know each other very well through the various conventions. So she's almost directly responsible for the psychic circus because... Uh, we went to the big Gallifrey One convention in Los Angeles and uh, she introduced me to the people from Big Finish, particularly Matt Fitton, a uh, lovely guy who, and we got talking and Matt, Jessica suddenly said, well, Stephen could write a story for you about the origins of the Psychic Circus. And there was a little pause and I thought, well, why not? 
Um, so, and Matt was great. I mean, he was very supportive um, and encouraging. So that's how it happened. So with particularly um, Ian Reddington, he was a standout character to me as the, as the, as the chief clown. In The Greatest Show, he was such... I, I was watching it again today and that he didn't have masses of dialogue, but he had a presence about him that was completely malevolent. How do you translate that kind of visual menace into an audio script? Uh, with difficulty. <laughs> um, I, 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 only, I only got my copy yesterday, or no, day, two days ago, um, and I was wondering how he would do it because um, uh, I, we cheat slightly. We're told he's a very funny clown, but you never actually see him on stage. Because uh, he would have to be such a different personality, and it would be very visual. So uh, um, it was why. And again, I tried not to override the part. Um, he doesn't carry as much of the actual exposition of the piece as some of the other characters, like Juniper Berry and um, Kingpin. And this really goes back to the start because. Um, I mean, Ian did a fantastic job. I mean, absolutely brilliant. But sometimes fans say, but he didn't have many lines to say. And I say, I do want to take some credit for that because I realized when I was writing it, if you've got a character who looks like that, and I, it was my idea to have that sort of the white face clown with the glitter outfit, not the, uh, you know, McDonald type clown. Um, that actually they couldn't say very much. The presence was more powerful than words. If he'd had more dialogue, I think he would have been less scary. Um, so it, it worked out very well in the sense that, I, for some people's point of view, I consciously underwrote, and then the actor came in and just, you know, flew with it. Have you had a chance to hear the audio yet? Yes, I did a couple of days ago. Excellent. Yeah. So he comes across to me very, very complete. Well, not very, completely, <laughs> completely insane. And yes. uh, I think he puts that across so well. That that laugh that he's got works so well on audio. Were you happy with that? How that turned out? Oh, fantastic! You know, I because I was thinking, what parts of his performance can you use on? audio and of course the laugh you can't do any of the fantastic gestures but you can use the laugh so i i dutifully wrote in the script he laughs or whatever and yeah ian did it uh, i i thought i was in on one of the days of the recording so i saw chris jury and Sylve, but i did i wasn't i couldn't be there when ian was working on it but um, no he did a fantastic job um so without giving too much away, um, try and keep it as spoiler free as possible. You've got a you've got a Paradise Towers connection in there. Um, yes. Was that a request from Big Finish, or was that something you injected yourself? That was something I injected myself, partly because I suppose there is one of the you know if you like narrative problems in the show is that the Doctor cannot get involved with the circus until really quite late in the story. So you have basically to create a separate narrative for the Doctor and his battle with, well, he's on the disc cover anyway, the master. And so that, so the Paradise Towers connection came about because of that. Okay, was that, was that a request to, for the master to be put in? Um, the, master, the master was the given of the story. Uh, I, I was basically told, please use the master and it'll be played by James Dreyfus. Um, I, uh, I think it's worked out very well, but that to me was the toughest element because I've never worked with any running characters from Doctor Who, particularly running baddies. So trying to work out how the master operated and finding a way of doing it in the story was where I was particularly dependent on Matt, my script editor, to help me through. Um, so it worked out well, but that was that. It was a given. So also was a given that um, 
the, the I think partly budgetary, there wasn't going to be a companion in there for the doctor. So we used the uh, the robot as a companion, which is a, a double. Um, uh, so that again was slightly technical problem, you know, to make that work because you don't have the usual give and take with a companion. Had you ever written anything for or worked with James Dreyfus before in any capacity? None at all, no. The main role I remember him from is for working with Rowan Atkinson in Thin Blue Line in the, in the 90s. Yes, years. that's right. Yes, yes. Completely I mean, different I character. <laughs> yes. he. I know his work. I've seen him on stage. Um, but uh, I, I think he's, I don't know, you may know, he, he has done a couple of big finishes as the master before. Yes. Um, but that was all I knew, really. Yeah, you know, with that injecting that bit of Paradise Towers in there, um, you've left yourself open for some more of your very distinctive Doctor Who universe. Would you consider coming back and writing for Big Finish again? Um, I would. I, I what I'd actually quite like to do is to do a historical story, because if I'd ever got a chance to write, you know, if Doctor Who hadn't terminated when it did. I would have tried to do a historical story um, because I've always loved, I love those when William Hartnell did them, you know, when he, 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 he got involved with the siege of Troy and things like that. I just, just loved all that stuff. Um, so, so I, I possibly would. Um, somebody is actually, again, uh, I'm not creatively involved, but somebody is planning to do a couple of comic books based on Paradise Towers. All right. Sort of spin-off stories featuring the Kangs. Um, so that would be nice. So I personally haven't got any... I'm not sure I've got anything else I need to say about um, Paradise Towers, if you see what I mean. Yep. The one person I am interested in bringing back at some point is, uh, is Captain Cook, who is one of my favourite characters. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was very good in, in The Greatest Show especially played by um, by T.P. McKenna. That's right, yes. Well, T.P. was actually my suggestion originally to play the chief caretaker in Paradise Towers. Okay. He, he was the person I suggested, and they went with, because Richard Briars is a big star, Yeah. they went with Richard Briars, um, who I get brought a much broader comic style to it than I'd actually expected. Doctor Who in the 80s, they sometimes had a tendency to put big names into roles that didn't quite suit. Um, yes. And I think Richard Bryce has been criticised for that role on occasion. He, he has. And I think he was a bit self-conscious about it, to be honest. Uh, I, I worked with him a couple of times after that, and he always referred to it and always saying, you know, I knew what I was doing, etc. But I think he was a little bit touchy about it. And... Oh, I don't know. I mean, it's a very funny performance. Um, <laughs> the, the thing I think he's particularly criticised for is the is the scenes when he comes back at the end as Caragnon. And one of the things people forget is that the stuff is not shot in sequence. He had the first scenes he did with those two scenes. Right. So judging how they related to anything else was very difficult. I just want to jump back and, and touch on something that you mentioned before. you keen on writing a historical. Is there any particular period in history that, that you prefer? Yeah, well, I'm thinking about I, I Last year I wrote my first novel, historical novel, which is basically set in the sort of Regency period, post, post the Battle of Waterloo, pre-Queen Victoria. Uh, and it's a period I find very interesting. So I would love to do something based on that sort of period, you know, rakes, dandies, gaming houses, that sort of stuff. I have no idea where it will happen. And of course, the other thing is you have, there's such a big catalogue now, both of the programme and of on, an even bigger one on Big Finish. I have no idea what has and hasn't been done, to be honest. Oh, I, <laughs> Just, I, if, if there is a single person out there that does know off the top of their head... Um... That would be uh, a walking encyclopedia, I would say. There is so much out there. It's so much, absolutely. Yeah. But, it, uh, yeah, definitely, I, I, I'm a big fan of historicals too, so I'm, I'm hearing yes. you. I'm hearing you. 
<laughs> so Psychic Circus is out. Um, uh, it, it was a really enjoyable listen, and uh, I appreciate you chatting with me, Stephen White. Thank you. Thank you. Nice talking to you, Dwayne. So I hope you had enjoyed that little chat I had with Stephen Wyatt. And my thanks, many thanks go to Stephen for giving me the opportunity at such an early stage of this podcast to um, have, a, have a chat with me about his work on the Psychic Circus. It was uh, a pleasure to chat with you, Stephen. Thank you. So the Psychic Circus is main range audio number 261. Go to bigfinish.com and grab yourself a copy. I can highly recommend it. I have heard on the grapevine that there's some changes coming to Big Finish main range of Doctor Who audios. Uh, They're going to go more for box sets. That's what I hear. It might have been said on a podcast or something, which I haven't heard as yet. I should be on top of that with an audio podcast, shouldn't I? But I've just heard that on the grapevine through Twitter feeds, etc. It'd be a shame, really, to stop the Big Finish main range of... It's the one that I ensure that I subscribe to without a doubt. And um, yeah, I guess I'll still get them if they go to box sets. But yeah, it'll it'll be a shame. Someone on social media mentioned, I I hope they go up to, or I wished they would go up to number 300 to round it off because that's number 261. But it would be a few years, a couple of years before they got to to 300 if they kept going at this particular rate. So if they want to make changes... They're going to have to sort of not worry too much about rounding off the the count on the spine for us completists. So yeah, we'll just have to deal with whatever they whatever they give to us. But you can always guarantee when it comes to big finish, whatever they do, it is of the highest quality and very enjoyable, very enjoyable storytelling. As the Psychic Circus is only one example of hundreds and hundreds that we're going to be talking about over the weeks and months that follow on the Sirens of Audio. Now, for a quick segment, I'm going to call Quick Tips. I'm going to give you an audio adventure that I have listened to recently that I won't be reviewing anytime soon on the Sirens of Audio and just talk very, very briefly about how good it is. And the one I listened to that really... I really love as a fan is the Diary of River Song. Now they're up to series seven or series eight coming out soon, but series six is the last one I heard of the Diary of River Song. Now, lover or hater, the stories are great. I don't understand how anyone can dislike River Song, but there are people who do. But if you haven't heard the audios featuring River Song, I can guarantee you you're in for a treat as far as storytelling goes. So, the Diary of River Song Series 6 is a set of stories surrounding earlier adventures of the Doctor. So I'll give you the episode titles. Um, the first, there's, there's four episodes in the box set. The first one is called An Unearthly Woman. So there's an adventure with River Song that goes on around the events of an unearthly child. And that's a fascinating little story. Lots of uh, interplay with Ian and Barbara, especially Ian and River. I love that. And the the First Doctor team is the David Bradley team. So it's the First Doctor Adventures team. Uh, it's not William Russell and Carol Ann Ford. So it's the it's the the new guys who are playing the First Doctor team at the moment. Um, the second story is called The Web of Time. And that is set around the events of the Web of Fear. And particularly Captain Knight. So River Song interacts here with Captain Knight. All the while, while these stories are happening... She has got to try and avoid the Doctor's story that is going on close by or that is about to happen. So I think this is just a fantastic idea. I love it. The third story is called Peep Show. Can you guess what that is? Yes, that is a story set in another section of the miniscope. So, you know, we saw Ogrons, we saw Cybermen. Um, so this one's got Ogron, Sontarans, Sontarans, Drashigs, all set in the miniscope with the third Doctor on a different part of the miniscope. So that's really good. The fourth one, The Talents of Greel, which is an awesome story set just before, only like only weeks before The Talons of Wang Chang, which is interesting because it introduces a new character to Lee Sin Chang's repertoire, uh, when we see him in Talons of Wang Chiang, 
he only has Mr. Sin. But in the talents of Griel, Lee Sin Chang has another sidekick, which is a really interesting one too. So yeah, definitely that box set is uh, a really cool one to to grab hold of. So to whet your appetite a little bit further, here's a trailer. Oh, hello. Sorry to startle you. I've been assigned to Totter's Lane, temporarily. WPC Pond. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions, The Diary of River Song, Series 6. Call me River. Really? An unusual name. Almost Romany. Nah, well, that's what we call aerobics. <laughs> Ooh, that was fun, Miss Song. What sort of gun is that? A very good one. But sadly, it won't hold them back forever. So what do we do? We haven't got time for this. Silence! She's trying to save you. She's space animal welfare. I said silence! Ooh. Sir! Sir, they're ready this way! Get back! Open fire! Did somebody call for the cavalry? Professor Song. Seize her! She must not escape! Henry? Miss Song, are you following me? Mr. Jiggle and... River Song. Charm. You get here earlier and earlier, Chang. Well, you know what I always say. If in doubt, shoot it! Big finish. We love stories. The audience is crying out. Please hear their stark entreaty. I'm listening. It's flattering, but nothing doing, sweetie. I cannot wait. I have to go. Goodbye and au revoir. So that wraps up episode two of the Sirens of Audio. Thanks very much for listening. I did promise that I'd have a co-host with me. Unfortunately, he's taken ill, so he wasn't able to join me for this particular episode. So uh, wish him all the best and hope we can get together soon. Also want to give a shout out to uh, some friends from other podcasts who have given me shout outs, particularly the guys from Proctor Who and Trek This Out. Make sure you check out those podcasts. Awesome, awesome stuff. The guys from the Doctor Who show have been very supportive too, so thank you for that. And I've had some feedback, one from um, Mark Cochran from Nerdology UK, uh, which which was really lovely. And I even got some from the fabulous Adam Richard. So I'm going to play that feedback for you right now. Hi, Dwayne. This is Mark in Exeter in England. I just wanted to say congratulations on a really cracking first episode of your podcast. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more reviews in the coming months. Hello, Dwayne. It's the fabulous Adam Richard from the multi-award resistant podcast, Adam Richard Has a Theory. Um, I loved your first episode. So exciting. Uh, I am a huge fan of Big Finish. Um, so I would love to join in with your podcast at some point, uh, although do not have time to listen to those four episodes you're talking about. Chimes of Midnight, I loved. It's a, it's a really great one. Uh not sure about the Psychic Circus. I'm not up to there yet. I'm about a year behind in my big finishes. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, joining you on this journey because I'm a huge Big Finish fan. And congrats on starting a new podcast. Woohoo! Oh, guys, that's lovely. Thank you so much for your support. And make sure you check out those two podcasts too, Mark Cochran's Nerdology UK. I think, I think I've got that right. And I have a theory... Adam Richards podcast, which is available at adamrichard.com.au. Thanks so much for your support. It really means a lot. And it gives me a bit of impetus to keep going, just knowing that even if it's other only other podcasters, there are people out there listening. Thank you. So at the time of this recording, it's between episodes nine and ten of series twelve. Yeah, it is series twelve, isn't it? Of Doctor Who. So I am eagerly awaiting within the next 24 and a bit hours to see The Timeless Children. By the time you hear this, The Timeless Children may have already gone out. So what did you think? Uh, What did you think of this podcast as well? Anything you want to give feedback-wise, feel free to do so. You can send me an email at sirensofaudio at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter at audiosirens. Uh, where else am I? If you go to anchor.fm slash sirens of audio, you can leave a voice message. You've got 60 seconds. You can say what you want. 
And if you make it nice and lovely, I may even play it on a show. Even if you make it horrible, if it's funny, I'll play it. I don't care. <laughs> so um, thanks very much for listening, guys. And since we're in a Cyberman mode, I have announced this, the audios that we're going to be listening to over the next three episodes. That is The Reaping, Eldred Must Die, and The Chimes of Midnight. Since we're in a, a Cyberman mood at the moment, due to the TV series that's happening, I thought I'd do The Reaping next. So next episode will be Doctor Who The Reaping, Main range audio number 86. If you've got it, listen to it. Send me your thoughts. Tell me what you think of Doctor Who the Reaping and uh, we'll have some fun next time. So don't forget to listen to Doctor Who audio because Doctor Who audio rocks. rocks. rocks.